welcome to the inaugural episode of Connecting the Dots. We'll be discussing our stories from the battlefield of consulting. Today, our topic is POCs, proof of concept software. We're going to be tackling what they are, when they're useful, some of the benefits that we've seen when we use them, and then how we build them, and of course, some of the negatives that come along with them. My name is Jesus Moreno, and you can ask me about front-end development, meditation, and mentorship. Um, I'm joined by my coworkers, Kareem, Phil, and Victor. Hi, I'm Kareem Jamal, a senior architect at Xpero. I enjoy designing software, getting involved in the community, and telling lots of lame jokes. Hi, I'm Phil Gambling. I'm a technical lead, and you can ask me about why you shouldn't use Angular and use React instead. Hi, my name is Victor Acuna. I'm a software consultant, and you can ask me about front-end code smells and the benefits of a four-day work week. Um, so I guess the first thing, I'll just present it as a question. What do you guys think of when you hear the term POC? I immediately think of short time frame. Like, mm -hmm. this isn't a long-term project, but we're trying to win somebody's confidence, either, you know, win potential uh, business with a client to show them what Xperio can do, or maybe a client needs us to work on something fast because they're trying to convince some other stakeholder within their own company or investors or the marketplace that, hey, they've got an idea they want to build, but it's always got to be done yesterday. It's always short and it's um, usually very, uh, not necessarily, well, it could be stressful, but you just are not really sure what you're getting into. Yeah, pretty much echoing that. Uh, it's something quick and dirty. It doesn't have to be that dirty, but just something to prove out a point or show something can be done or validate some ideas before you dive into it with uh, more resources. So whether it's getting you know buy-in from your manager or department or you know sales folks taking it around to see, hey, does this idea you know, hold any water or not. And it doesn't even have to be code per se. It can be just, you know, wireframes or some sort of UX uh, that proves out the point. Yeah, I used to think of it a lot more from the idea perspective. I guess having it be a, a major way that we do business has changed that a lot because there's much more of an expectation of it can be done, let's prove that it can be done. Whereas my original thinking was always, can this even be done, let's try it, you know, it might not work. But now, uh, the few times I've worked on a POC, it's, it's usually like, we know this can work. We have this to work with from the start. Can you make this a reality? Yeah, I think like we usually aren't jumping into it. Think, if we think we can't do it, we're, we're probably not even stupid enough to try to take that. But right, that client, that potential client isn't convinced yet. And really, it's it's like, you know, basically like, will we be able to expand on this and show you like what we could do in some short time frame, right? But uh, with the promise of like, like oh, but, you know, mm -hmm. if you just get a little more money, right? Mm -hmm. We can we'll get all this. Like this is the tip of the iceberg. That being said, I think I have been on a few POCs where we don't go in, kind of knowing whether something can be done, but we think the problem is solvable, right? Like mm -hmm. like go in with a certain set of solutions that we think might work, but I think or at least the ones that I've been on, part of the process is kind of whittling down to that final, this is what we're actually going to implement and hopefully move more, more, more business out of that. One other good thing for POCs is it's as much of what do you want to build as it is what don't you want to build. Mm -hmm. So if you go to someone asking for requirements, it's hard for them to just you know, spit stuff out and say, here's exactly what I want. In fact, there's probably a, I think there's a Dilbert comic related to that too, where he goes to the customer and says, what are the requirements? What do you want me to build? And he's like, can you build me software that tells me my requirements, right? So <laughs> it, it, it sums it up pretty well. And really sometimes you just have to put something in front of the user. It doesn't have to be the right yeah. thing or whatever, just something close enough to where they have 
you know, a jumping off point to say yes or no, this is what I want, this is what I don't want, or I want something like this, but, you know, so and so. So it's a good tool to get you to the requirements they want. And so that brings us to our next question, which is now that we know what a POC is, what are some of the benefits that we've seen, like being able to use them? You mentioned client, like being able to get client requirements um, because they're actually having something in front of them. Do we have any other? I mean, it's a, it, so yeah, I was just going to echo what you were saying that, yeah, basically helping the client, helping the stakeholder refine that vague notion, you know, of requirements. And, and, and sometimes it's even a POC might even be like, in actually developing a feature, sometimes you, th you got to throw something at the wall. So maybe even in that mature product, you know, you're kind of building a little POC features like, okay, we really don't know what we want here. So let's just throw something out there to help people have a conversation and like gather around it. And so that initial POC, yeah, it's like kind of refining, you know, everyone wants everything, right? So you got to like, you got to kind of have something to focus on. I do think that I've always seen the benefit is there's maybe lower stakes. Like there's a little bit of wiggle room to make some mistakes or to try some rougher concepts. But I think that also just comes with the territory of not necessarily knowing exactly what you're going to do up front. I mean, how can you expect it to be perfect if you don't know? I think that the very existence is a benefit. Like the idea of a POC can lead to a successful product or project or anything. Some results that is bigger than just a POC gives people the confidence to say, okay, we can request a POC and we know that even though it might seem rough at the very beginning, this can evolve into something better. And there's value in doing some quick stuff up front. So I guess um, to go on a slightly different track, we're all developers. Do we see any benefits like just for our own day-to-day -day jobs working on POCs versus more like production ready software? There is some, I mean, taking some shortcuts can be fun and it can be a, a little bit less stressful if you don't need to worry about. I mean, if you can put something at the end, like authentication, you know, you don't need to do it up front. You just focus on solving the problem and just know that you have to do it later. That's kind of nice, you know. Uh, process can usually be a lot more flexible too. That's what I think about all the time. You know, just you want to keep track of what tasks to do and there's planning that needs to be done. And, you might have even more meetings or more uh, face time with the customers going over whatever you did, but there's less of this idea of like, you absolutely know the full timeline, exactly what you're going to be doing over the next few months. You get to figure it out. I think that's nice. I, I prefer that. Two things come to mind for me. Um, one is trying out uh, new technologies real quickly. Cause you know that something you're working on right now, you have a chance to revisit you know, perhaps what the POC is done. So it's, it's a quick, it's interesting and it's fun in that regard where you, you can try stuff out quickly and whatever you find out from there could come back and benefit the rest of your development team too, right? Pros and cons for trying this technology. At the same time though, you may want to go, go with the tools you know if you've got like a time crunch, like I don't want the learning curve of learning some new framework, some new design system and I just need to get something out the door so it's like, yeah, it's a little bit of both, right? Like if you've got, if you've got the leeway, it's fun to try some new stuff, but also, you know, that's a risk. Right. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. The second thing is it gives you that adrenaline rush, right? Sometimes we want this like hard deadlines, lots of technology, and just the excitement of taking something from literally nothing from scratch to something that has lots of good eye candy and features and stuff, which excites you know, uh, customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. The, to me, it's the, uh, the adrenaline rush of having a problem presented to me and then not knowing if I'm going to be able to solve it by, you know, by, by the deadline. It usually gets solved, um, but there's definitely that element of, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And then you just, yeah, and then you figure it out and there's just like, yes, that's nice. <laughs> So that kind of transitions us or something that um, that you Kareem and Phil were just went back and forth a little bit trying out new tech versus going with tools, you know, how does that transition into if you have a POC and the client decides to extend their business. Like if we use new technology, 
does that affect whether we use the old code base? Do we want it using an old code base or do we start from scratch? You might like, yeah, well, part of the new tech might be client uses some some library and we want to prove that we can use it and integrate with maybe some existing system or some existing whatever choices they've got. So POC might be also showing like, hey, yeah, we can work with that. Um, but yeah, so that's a consideration and right, anything you produce that might potentially be reasonable. I guess it's like, it's a conversation. Don't pick something that's just so far left field that is going to be a waste when it does come into building that real system because even though if it is a POC and throwaway code, it never really is. And you would mm -hmm. want to ideally leverage or mature that to somebody you can reuse. So if, it, if it's like, well, I just wanted to learn Svelte, let's just pick on like, you know, framework du jour. So I just want to learn Svelte. And then when it comes to going to production, it's like, well, no, we can't use that. We were definitely going to do this all in React. Well, that's kind of, that might not have been a wise choice because now I've got to start from scratch. And it's hard to explain that, especially to the non technical stakeholder that, or look like you had all of that working. Why can't you just pull all those components out and reuse them here? We've had that. I've gone through a few of those transitions, mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, you would you would want to keep the the eventual tech choice I think in mind. The more you know about your context and your landscape that you're working in going into it, the better informed decision you can make, right? So if the, the client already has some technology of choice. You can either say, okay, we're going to do it in this and, you know, knowing that we're going to roll into full application development after the POC. But if you feel, and it's also more important at the same time to get something out quicker and you're better at a different technology and you know that that other one is more lightweight or you're just more familiar with it, where you can get something out in say half the time or 75% of the time then maybe that's the win that the client needs at that moment to go sell the idea and, you know, to their higher ups, get buy-in, um, get funding, whatever they need. Uh, and then you can revisit and come back and say, okay, now we do the actual application development in the client's language of choice, knowing that, hey, this POC was just for the purpose of getting that, you know, the sell. I had this happen recently with maybe even just a smaller point of contention, but even though we were making an application and it was in React, we had some architectural difficulties where we maybe could have used hooks better, but many of us were somewhat new to it and we ended up with a mix of it and Redux. And because it was a POC, it didn't really matter that much in the end. It all worked and it all worked pretty well, but one item of you know, technical debt that we wanted to revisit for sure, if we continue to expand on it was we need to clean this up. Now that we have better knowledge, come in and say, okay, we're gonna do it all in books. So even if you have everything decided up front, you can still encounter that when you're working fast or if you're working with a slightly new thing within something you're familiar with, you can end up with that kind of point in your head where you know you need to go back and fix this. But that's part of the process. You understand that going in or you should. And keep in mind that when we say new technologies, it doesn't have to be, you know, at the very intrinsic foundational level, right? We can still use the language of choice and hey, here's a chance to try, uh, test out a new visualization library, yeah. right? Which might be easier to swap in if the client doesn't like it or doesn't work out or it ends up being more complicated than needed. Mm -hmm. So there's decisions to make there. Yeah, I think what it really comes down to is what is the client really trying to prove? I think Kareem, you kind of touched on this, figuring out what do they care about this POC accomplishing versus what things are flexible, what, like, where can we bend? One of the things that, I, that we keep kind of coming close to, but not really diving into is we keep mentioning the client. Obviously it's important because it's done, it's work done for the client, but even with the tech debt conversation, Victor, um, how do we have those conversations with the clients? Maybe Phil and Kareem who have worked in this industry for a bit longer can chime in on that. Like how often do you actually get to have that conversation? Are there different approaches that you take to explain to the client, this is throwaway code or like, like how do you find out what those expectations are? Yeah. So, so your question is like that kind of, how do you balance knowing that you're to some degree, you're going to have to write kind of quick and dirty code, but you don't want to 
I'm in saying like I'm just gonna write the sloppiest code with the linter turned off and mm -hmm. and everything. Um, yeah, I guess like trying to think back to my experiences, like you really are trying to weigh how like how important is the time deadline to them mm -hmm. and what you know, kind of going through those. What is the POC going to accomplish? Is it is functionality and features more important than because they're trying to win over some someone else's buy-in? Then um, then yeah, I mean you. Like you be honest, like you you know, okay, I, this might not be the best bug free code you're gonna see, but I think we'll be able to wow them with you know X Y Z key features. But if this is really just like we want to see uh, what's possible here, we want to reuse this, then I think the conversation is like it's like that iron triangle of like features, quality, time deadline, right? You can pick two, you can't have all three, and so I mean that like applies to software in general, but. Thing with the POC discussion, just trying to where where on that triangle of, of constraints are we? What's more, most important? And uh, full disclaimer, you can, I mean, it's it's best if you know what you're getting into uh, from the get go. And sometimes, you know, the client will be like, "Yes, this is fine. Just do quick and dirty for now, and we can, uh, you know, we can rewrite this stuff later." And then once we deliver the POC and they get the buy-in and now they have all these aggressive deadlines to get the product out, uh, they will suffer from, you know, what we call short-term memory loss, right? <laughs> Where it's like, oh, yeah, well, we, we just have to get it out. What can we do anything to get this out uh, in its current state? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can, uh, you know, push back and say, look, it's really not recommended and it's going to fall down and here's how it's going to fall down and propose a plan to say, okay, here's what we need to refactor or change out to make this a little more stable uh, versus the standing stilts. Uh, other times, you just have to face the reality that it, it is what it is, and we have to continue going on the POC we've built. And over time, as opportunities allow, try to make it a little more robust and stable as we go along. All right, I think that transitions us to one of our last points and questions you have your POC and now you, and the client now wants to transition it to something more prod ready what are some of the techniques or approaches that we take with that like assuming you've done the best that you can you have the code that you have how do you transition that and just be more like production ready uh I mean I think you know you take that code base that you produce and you just keep working on it but now you're putting you know, whereas to get the POC done, you might have been like, I don't care about the linter. I'm going to copy and paste like crazy. I mean, I, I was writing quality code the first time, so that's never a problem. <laughs> but you just, yeah, you, you, I guess the creation of the POC is a lot more flexible and lenient on things like quality. Now you're turning up the quality. And so, you know, there's going to be healthy doses of refactoring as you go. And I feel like you always know, like, okay, here are all the shortcuts I took to get here. Now I need to go back and prioritize those and fix those those holes or those deficiencies and then and then yeah hopefully you're just you're being honest with your stakeholder like okay yeah now we here's this list of tech that we've amount we've accumulated let's start bringing those in obviously you can't week one necessarily fix all of it you just got to prioritize but I it's rarely I mean I guess it you might you might start from scratch it might be a completely new project and you just pull in the pieces you need so that might be another angle to it that okay we were just going to create new code base and all like say it's react to react okay i'll pull out the components i want to reuse but i know i don't want the whole thing i guess i've been in both where it's been a full rewrite because we end up picking a totally different framework because of uh customers reasons or if it was just a continuation of the poc and just adding more uh, functionality to it it also depends on when you're doing the transition, who the receiver is. Are we just handing off the POC to sales and they're just, they want to be able to just double click a file and, you know, show it off in an offline manner even, which is something we've done also uh, to where it helped the sales team validate the market even before uh, the business decided to go all in on the idea. That was so useful, in fact, that even after we were well under full-on application development, they continued to use that, I want to say, even a year or more after they went live in production, they continued to use that 
just because it was such a great sales tool because it supported offline capabilities. Mm -hmm. So how you, the transition there is a little different where you package it up into a neat little, you know, double click package versus are we continuing, like the developers that did the POC, are they continuing to do the development, the full blown application development? In which case, you know where you took the shortcuts and what things you need to, you know, now go and uh, build out better versus is it transitioning to some other team to where now all that stuff in your head, you need to get down in documentation as well as do a handoff meeting with the receiving team so they're aware of all the shortcuts we took because as any developer knows it's you you have a tendency to blame the previous developer right and it just becomes easier <laughs> uh, you, they don't know what's going on and it's like a abrupt handoff mm -hmm. so the better the better you know who's taking on the development or what's going to happen with the poc uh you would take different steps to do that transition yeah i also think priorities can come into it question, especially when you're talking about continuing. There's no handoff. There's just, we want to keep going, but it's start with what we have from the POC. I know for my most recent example, even though we had some tech debt that we would have definitely prioritized, there were also features that we may have taken out in order to meet a deadline that they're going to want first. Like the client is going to be more interested in those things being implemented earlier on. So if you know there's a list already and you might need to reconcile it with tech debt, and I guess in our case, we would only do something major. Like if there was a major underlying problem, technical problem, which we didn't have in our case, we would go have to say, we need to fix this first. But because there isn't, I know that there would be other things that would be prioritized above tech debt. And then obvious considerations when you go into full application development mode are, you know, the best, the best practices like having a continuous integration, continuous deployment environment, uh, having all that stuff, having proper, you know, Git or source control management, uh, all, all the stuff that you may have, you know, surpassed or bypassed rather when you were doing the quick POC. Or you have to hand it off and move it all into their pipeline yeah. or their repo. <laughs> I was going to say, there is a joy in just Git commit, checkpoint, work in progress, just work. <laughs> you know, like I don't care about messages. I don't have. I'm not using Git flow. I'm not, I don't have a branching strategy. I just like, uh, I'm basically saving, like at the end of the day, pushing it somewhere. Yeah. But that's not what you're supposed to do in prod software. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do that, but. yeah, pro tip, make sure you check your uh, source control, check in messages. <laughs> and, you know. What are some of the questions that developers should be asking on these POCs? Like if you know your it's due in a week, what are some of the questions you should start asking or even at the start of a project? Um, why are we building it? Mm -hmm. Like what's the, what's the end goal? What's the, mm -hmm. or what, what problem? I guess the first thing I usually ask is uh, along the why is what problem are we trying to solve? Because sometimes someone tells us we need to build this. Well, they're giving us a solution that might not be the best solution to the problem. So I always get to the problem first. And then maybe you or someone else has a better solution in mind that you can propose, which might be cheaper, more effective, efficient, anything, right? Yeah, I think in my experience, it comes down to developers needing to be kind of active in those conversations as opposed to taking the, um, what I feel is, is more of a traditional structure where your PM will tell you what to build. Like your manager will say, these are the features we're building go build them. I think developers, especially with short-term engagements, have a responsibility to ask why, like, like you said, why are we building this? What are we building? Is there a way that the client prefers this to be built? Um, and then some, some harder questions, like just straight up ask your project manager, what has the client been told? Like, mm -hmm. what are the company goals that come out of this POC? And then you can start to figure out what the trade-offs are that you need to make. And some of these things are harder for developers because just from, you know, history and uh, culture differences and just more of the introverted nature of developers, they often don't speak up and they just yeah. do what they're told, whether it be waterfall or agile, if they're given some requirements or tasks, they'll quietly put their head down and do them. They tend to be uh, a timid bunch. Exactly. And so this is, this is more of a challenge to, you know, 
get out of your comfort zone and start speaking up. And uh, it might feel a little difficult at first, but once you get the hang of it, it definitely solves a lot of problems and a lot of confusion. Yeah, I think it's important for developers to speak up in particular because we are kind of working with like the actual <laughs> physical product. We're actually building it out. So we have a pretty unique perspective on it. And we're the only ones that know the limitations of the technology. Like the, it's not the client's job to worry about that. It's our job. It's not even our project manager's job to know that. It's our job to communicate that to them. But I think it can be a lot easier as a developer to ask questions while you're working on it, like when you're in the thick of it, because, you know, you can really do everything, right? At the start on a blank sheet of paper, it's hard to say, no, we can't do that. That's for me. But if you are in the middle of it and you've been working on it and you know, well, we already went down this path and I, we're being asked to do this, we can't really do that. It's a lot easier to push back even because you may have already developed uh, a sense of trust with the client. And so you're able to say, well, you know, I know this, like you speak with confidence now and they have, you know, they're able to listen to you with confidence. And it can mean that you have some hard discussions in the middle of it. Maybe some stuff gets cut or maybe you help them understand that something that they're asking for is a much bigger ask than it might seem. But that's maybe the most important thing to me is, is keeping expectations reasonable while stuff is in process and being willing to make cuts or make changes to what you're doing based on that. In summary, basically, it, we're just trying to show how we use, you know, POCs at Xperia mm -hmm. and how powerful they can be. But they do come with drawbacks and warnings that you need to be aware of. Otherwise, you might find yourself in uh, a maintenance nightmare uh, if you're not careful. And keeping open and honest communication with the client throughout the process and making them clear of the risks and shortcuts you're taking. It's not always necessarily the developer or technical dev team's control because someone might, someone running the sales side of that may be making all kinds of promises, right? Correct. And uh, you're, you know, you don't know that they necessarily just said, oh yeah, yeah it'll be production ready, don't worry. We're, yeah. You know, so there's, there's that. So, too. so making sure your communication channels are open with your sales team and your, you know, project managers and all that as well. I mean, especially in POCs, uh, communication is very important. You need to be having that, you know, on a very frequent basis with all the stakeholders involved. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to connecting with you next time when we'll be discussing the UX developer design handoff.